No? Um, all right, let's do a little review and then we'll dive. This is our last full day of RYM. This is it for a whole nother year. So uh, let's review where we've been. Uh, the overall title of this class is what? Therefore, we're looking at the overall subject of? Okay, or if you're an optimist, assurance, very good. And we said we're building a house. The first day we laid the foundation, which is? Christ alone, the only solid foundation upon which to build our lives that will not fail us in this life, as we'll see today, and will not fail us in the greatest storm, the day of judgment. Then the next day, we talked about our struggle with sin. How the devil can use that against us. And we looked at our struggle with sin from two vantage points. First, we said a life without repentance is a life without Jesus. That when God gives us saving faith, that faith begins to produce works. He gives us His Spirit who produces His fruit. Therefore, obedience and the fruit of the Spirit are the walls to our house. They don't save us but they necessarily come up from the foundation. Jesus will see to that. And therefore, when we see evidence of change in our lives, it is a further evidence, a confirmation to us that our faith is real, that it is true saving faith. But if we say we have no, or if we say that there, we know Jesus and there is no evidence of change, right? There is no transformation taking place in us, then we are liars and we are deceiving ourselves, which is an important thing to remember because our main question we're trying to answer this week is, are you a what? Or a... That's it. So, uh, but then we saw that uh, a life with Jesus is a life of struggle with sin. That believers aren't sin free. That we struggle with sin. How we struggle is key. Not running away from God when we commit our besetting sins. Or when we commit or remember a grievous sin. The devil uses those sins to whisper in our ears, you're not really a Christian. In those moments we are to run to God, confess our sins to Him, Lay our guilt and shame at His feet and do what? Ufasa. Do what? Remember, right? Remember what? Now we need to know this. Remember what? What are we to remember in our struggle with sin? It's, it's absolutely essential that we're forgiven. So the broader term for that is what? The gospel. We're to apply the gospel, what Jesus did at the cross, taking the judgment of God for that besetting sin, and what He did in His life in not committing that sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God uh, to Him. So we apply the gospel by faith to our struggle with sin when we are tempted to only look inward and really disbelieve the gospel. It's in the dark night of the soul when we are struggling with ourselves and we're starting to buy the devil's whispers that we need the grace of God to enable us to lean even harder into Jesus and say, no, the gospel is still true. God loves me and accepts me because of how good Jesus is, not because of how good I am today. And since that's true, what does that do to my heart for God? It causes it to enlarge, and I want to repent of my sins. Okay? So that's what we looked at two days ago. Yesterday, we saw how important it is that we rest in our union with Christ and that we live in communion with Him. So God has, through Jesus, uh, through faith, we are united to Jesus so that everything that Jesus accomplished and won for us at the cross, all of those benefits flow most certainly to us. The assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, a growing and persevering in grace to the end of our lives, and other benefits we remember at death and at the second coming of Jesus. We're to, they're ours. We're to rest in those and realize God is like a father who delights to lavish gifts upon his children and watch you enjoy them. 
then we said, but we don't really deeply enjoy those gifts in our lives. Why is that? Many times it's because we are living fragmented lives, living for self-pleasure rather than for Jesus, living for um, our righteousness rather than being grounded in His, living for our glory rather than God's glory. And we talked about relationships and school and athletics and so forth. And then we said that it's also because uh, we're not spending time with God in His Word and when we do, we spend it the wrong way, right? So what's the key question we want to ask a passage when we come to it? Do you remember? What does it say about the heart of God for me because of Jesus? That's the first question I want to ask. It will revolutionize how you read the Bible. Okay? All right, today we're going to look at, and that's the central pillar to the house. Uh, today we're going to close things up by looking at the character and promises of God. Someone read Psalm 42 where we can hear it. As the deer camps for the streams of water... So my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? Okay, hold one second. I want you to notice while she's reading the agony of the psalmist. That's what I want you to think about. All right, go ahead. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive folk. My, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, of the heights of Hermon, from the mountain of Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about my morning oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, or I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. Thank you. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray for the hurting in this room today that your promises and who you are would be a healing balm to their souls. Oh Jesus, help us because life is hard. And we are tempted then to believe things that are untrue. So may your voice speak louder to us than that of the devil. And may that begin today. In Jesus' name, amen. What can lead us to doubt? Difficult circumstances. Trials have a way of entering our lives and wreaking havoc on our minds, hearts, and emotions. I mean, think about it. When people go through intense difficulty in their lives, what are their common reactions? What questions do we tend to ask? Why? Why me? Why me, even more specifically, yeah. What else? Yeah, where are you, God? If God's so loving, why would you speak? Good. If God is so loving, why is this happening to me? Anybody else? What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? So immediately, many times, in response to trial, we think either God is punishing us, okay, which may be a question to ask. He disciplines those whom He loves, sometimes through trial. But a lot of times when we ask that question, what we really mean is, God's against me. We start to question God's heart toward us, that He's really judging me through this. Trials can even lead us to doubt our salvation because inside, in our hurt, we begin to say, 
if I belonged to God and God really belonged to me, this wouldn't be happening to me. I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. It hurts so bad. Surely, when difficulty strikes in our lives, if we're not grounded in God's Word, then doubt will soon follow. Now guys, y'all are young. And yet some of you have already gone through intense sorrows in your lives. Someone you love has died. Your parents have gotten a divorce. You're the victim of some form of abuse, whether it be verbal, whether it be bullying, whether it be physical, sexual. Some of you have friends that have come down with a life-altering or life-threatening disease. The rest of you haven't gone through such big trials in your life yet. You will, but not yet. For you, it's been more of a relentless series of smaller trials that are coming at you one after another after another and they've left you on the brink of a nervous breakdown. That's the way the writer of this psalm felt. He felt like the breakers and the waves of trial, verse 7, were rolling over him. I told you on the first day that my children, when they were young, their favorite thing to do when they come to the beach is to build sandcastles. I also said, that's not my favorite thing to do at the beach. My favorite thing to do at the beach has always been, and still is to this day, body surfing. I love to ride waves. When I was younger, my family came to Destin on vacation and a hurricane was brewing out in the Gulf of Mexico. It was my mom, my dad, and my older brother and me. The hurricane was brewing and you know what that means. Awesome waves. Red flag means get in now and have a blast. And so we get in and my brother and I are starting to body surf in these awesome waves, taking one after another. And I'm out there waiting for the next wave to come and I see it. It begins to build and build. It is the granddaddy of all waves. And I'm getting ready to take it, and it builds up here, but I take it just a little too late, and the wave drives me down to the bottom of the ocean, rolls me three times in the sand, and I'm trying to come up for air, and I come up, and I take a gasp for breath, I wipe the water from my eyes, open my eyes, and another wave smashes me in the face, drives me back down, rolls me. I come up again gasping for air and another freaking wave hits me in the face. <laughs> That's the way the writer of this all felt. Man, the trials were coming wave after wave after wave, crashing on his head, leaving him exhausted and gasping for air. Have you ever gone through something that hurt so deeply that you felt like you couldn't breathe? The result? He was in despair, verses 5 and 11. He had been crying so much... His tears had been his food day and night, verse 3. He was oppressed and in mourning, verse 9. The hurt was so deep and real in his life, it was affecting him physically. He actually hurt in his bones. And he came to the point where he felt like God had forgotten him. What are we to do in such times? This psalm tells us very clearly. Are you ready? He says, talk to yourself. Do you ever do that? I talk to myself all the time. He says, talk to yourself. Look at what he says in verse 5. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope 
in God. What's he doing? He's talking to his soul. And he is reminding himself verbally, out loud, about what is true about God. Why? Because trials mess with our perspective. Trials mess with our perspective. We start thinking things that are untrue about God and our relationship with Him. And just like when we struggle with sin and we're tempted to believe things that are untrue about God and ourselves, and in those moments we're to apply the gospel to our struggle with sin, it's the same thing in trials. Because trials strike in your life and the devil comes alongside you, your enemy, who wants to devour your faith, and he whispers, See, you're not really a Christian. God doesn't really love you. If you were His, and He were yours, this wouldn't be happening to you. God's not for you. He's against you. In that moment, this psalm teaches us, remember what God is really like and what God has really said. That's what he means when he says, hope in God. Hope Lean, the faith lean, all your weight into who God is and what He has said. And where do we learn who God is and what He says, what He promises? In the Bible, right? Now, that's an obvious answer, but the reality is we tend to form our view of God based upon our feelings in the moment, based upon our past experiences and our response to trial. And so while everything inside of us is screaming, God is this. And we start to become bitter at God. We start to hate God. Because He's brought this into my life, this pain. In those moments, we're to run to the Bible and remember, now this is what God is really like. And this is what God has really said. What I want you to see today is that there are two things that are the keys to our abiding assurance, especially in the day of trial. The character of God and the promises of God. We're going to look at three aspects to God's character. The first one is this, the goodness of God. The goodness of God. In verse 9, well first, in this psalm, he talks about how his enemies looked at his trial and all that he was struggling with, and they start mocking him. They start saying to him, ha, Where is your God now? All day long, they're taunting him with that question. And after a while, the psalmist starts to buy it. He starts to believe what they're saying until he's basically looking up at God and saying, Where are you? Why have you forgotten me? What's underneath that question? A questioning of the goodness of God. It was January 1st, 1992. I was in Memphis, Tennessee over the Christmas holidays visiting my in-laws. We were literally packing up, getting ready to go back to Yazoo City, Mississippi, where I served as the youth minister at First Presbyterian Church. Worked there with a fellow, the pastor, whose name was Mike Sartell. I'm packing up, getting ready to go back, and the phone rings. And it's my secretary, Sandy Tucker, in Yazoo City. And she's just weeping. And she keeps saying over and over again, Oh, Joey, Nate is dead. Nate is dead. Mike Sartell and his family were driving back from Osceola, Arkansas, where they were visiting friends over the holidays. They were headed back toward Yazoo City and were coming into West Memphis, Arkansas, just over the bridge from Memphis. They're driving down the interstate when suddenly the driver of another vehicle traveling on the opposite side of the interstate somehow lost control of her car, jumped the median, and crashed headlong into the Sartell vehicle. 
Mike Sartell, 39 years old, pastor, husband, and father, died instantly, snapped his neck. Catherine Sartell, 15 years old, lost her spleen but survived. Preston Sartell, who was here on Tuesday, broke his back but survived. Nate Sartell, seven years old, who moments earlier had asked his parents if he could unbuckle to reach down to get a crayon he had dropped, died of internal bleeding. Cars had now stopped. Everybody was getting out, rushing over to the vehicle to see if they could help. Diane Sartell, the mother, knew just by sight her husband was dead. She poured out of the car onto the road on her hands and knees with broken ribs and the people who stopped to help heard her saying over and again, please pray for my family. Please pray for my family. They took them to the hospital in West Memphis, Arkansas. Immediately when I got the call, I headed down to the hospital. I was met in the hallway by an older minister, Wayne Herring. At this time, I'm still in seminary. He looks at me and he says, Joey, you're going to have to grow up fast. And I walked over to the hospital room where Diane was lying, the mother. And I stopped. And I had no idea what to say. What do you say to somebody who's just gone through what she's gone through? I opened the door and I walked in and I sat down on her bed and I took her by the hand. And just when I was about to bumble something out, she said, Oh, Joey, God is good. God is is good. How could she say that? Everything in her life was screaming, God is not good. She just lost her husband in the prime of his life. She just lost her baby in a car wreck. God is good? Are you kidding me? Where was her lean in the midst of her worst nightmare? Her lean was into what she knew to be true from His Word about God. God is good no matter what we go through. What does Psalm 23 say? <clears throat> Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Even though I walk through this dark and lonely and scary and threatening place where even death is threatening me, I will not fear. Why? Because you, God, are with me. You're with me in the valley. You're with me in the darkness, in the hurt, in the loneliness. With my tears, you know my tears. You collect them in a bottle. You've been in this valley before at the cross. And you're with me now there. And when I'm tired and exhausted and I can't go on because my strength is so sapped from the pain, you will pick me up. And you will carry me. I will not fear for you're with me. And he gives another reason. Because your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. God's goodness is with us in the valley. He doesn't become, if I can use the expression, not good when we go through trials. He is with us and His goodness is at work in us even while we suffer. Right? What does Romans 8.28 say? We know that God causes all things, good things, bad things, hard things, difficult things, heart-wrenching things. He causes them all to work together for our what? Good. Why? Because He is good. So don't you see that when we go through pain in this life, it's not an evidence 
that God is absent, that He's abandoned us or forgotten us, it's an evidence that He is present and at work within us for our good to conform us to the image of Jesus. We don't understand it. We don't get it. It still hurts to the depth of our soul. But our comfort is God is good. God is good. Even when it feels like He's not. The goodness of God were to lean into it. Second aspect of God's character is the power of God. The power of God. Take a look and somebody read. Well, first, before you read that, in this psalm, in Psalm 42, the name for God most often used is the name El, E-L, which means or refers to the strength of God. What does he call God in verse... Where is it? Verse 9, I say to God my, there it is again, God my rock. You said it the other day, what does that mean? God my strength, God my stability, God the one who is immovable. The psalmist is appealing to the strength and the power of God as his hope in the midst of his great trials. Somebody read Isaiah 40 verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? So he gives us two pictures in Isaiah. First he talks about the hollow of God's hand. Now, what is the hollow of the hand? Everybody take your hand and palms up. Now cup your hand like this. That indention in the center of your palm is the hollow of the hand. How much, the Bible says, Isaiah says, God holds the waters of the earth in the hollow of His hand. But how much water do you think I can hold in the hollow of my hand? Well, let's do an experiment, shall we? Water, hand. All right, here we go. Okay, maybe a tablespoonful, right? <laughs> Nearly two-thirds of the earth's surface is covered in water. In some places, six miles deep. Were we to begin to try and calculate the total volume of water on this planet in gallons, the number would blow our minds. And yet the Bible says God holds it all in the hollow of His hand. Think about that when you're swimming in that ocean today. But Isaiah also says God measures the heavens with the breadth of His hand. Now what's a hand's breadth? All right, take your hand, spread your fingers out wide. It's the distance between the tip of your thumb to the tip of your pinky when your fingers are spread wide. On my hand, it's about six inches. The distance to the nearest star other than the sun is 27 trillion light years away. That's 27 000 000 000 000 000 000. 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000. It's a long way. And that's just to the nearest star. Were we to try and comprehend the distance across the entire universe, we couldn't fathom the number. And yet God says He measures it all with the breadth of His hand. Gang, it's in that all-powerful, almighty hand that God holds you. Your circumstances are going to scream at you at times, God can't handle this. They're going to scream at you, this feels like God is losing His grip on me. It hurts so bad. I feel like I'm going to fall through His fingers. And yet God says, no. I've got you in my hand. And nothing and no one can snatch you out of my hand. Not the hardest trial you face, not the devil himself, not anything in this world, not even you can take yourself out of my hand. I've got you and I'll never let you go. 
Will you allow yourself to lean into that in the midst of your hurt right now? The power of God. Third aspect of God's character is the love of God. The love of God. Look at verse 8. He talks about, by day, the Lord directs His love. And that term love in Psalm 42 means steadfast love, relentless love, never give up love, can't be thwarted love. That's the love of God for you. Now when we think about the love of God, I want to give you about three pictures of that. The first picture is God's love is determined toward you. Think back now, before the world was ever created, God saw you. And God knew every single sin you would ever commit in your life. Every sinful thought you would ever think, every sinful deed you would ever do, every sinful word you would ever utter, God saw it all at once. Now if we saw all of our sins of our entire lifetime in one moment of time, what would it do to us? What do you think? It would destroy us. We would take a gun and blow our brains out. We could not handle the sight. God sees it all at once. And what does He do? He says of you, if you're in Christ, I choose to love you anyway. I am setting my love upon you. And then in time, He sends His Son and He kills Him so that He doesn't have to hold those sins against you anymore. He holds them against His only begotten Son instead. He judges Him. He pours out His anger on Him. He dies this agonizing death. He turns His back on His Son. And then you were born. And you started growing up. And God was pursuing you in ways in which you had no idea. And then there came a moment in time in which God wooed you to Himself, irresistibly drew you to Himself, and won your salvation. And in that moment... Your eyes were opened and you saw the beauty of God's love and you said, I believe. I believe. Nothing in heaven, earth, or hell could keep the determined love of God from all eternity from reaching you and winning you so that you might know forever the depths of God's love. Second picture. Think about God in this way. Alright, here we got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? One God in three persons forever. I'm not drawing the triangle to try and explain the Trinity, so give me a break. All right, so here you got the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to think about the Father-Son relationship. God the Father has eternally existed as God the Father. God the Son has eternally existed as God the Son. He didn't become, Jesus didn't become the Son of God when He was born into this world or when He was baptized or when He rose from the dead. He has always existed as the Son of God. Therefore, how would you describe the relationship that existed, the communion or fellowship of love that existed between the Father and Son for all eternity past. How would you describe it? What must it have been like? 
Say it real loud. A spiral of delight. A spiral of delight. Oh, that's pretty awesome right there. A poet. That's very good. Huh? It's Ricky's words. Oh, it's Ricky's words. I left early. I'm sorry. Okay, so a spiral of delight. But it was a really good meal. All right, what else? Perfect and not lacking anything. Okay, it was absolutely perfect. Didn't lack anything. What else? Okay, Uncompre incom incomprehend uncom yeah, okay, uncomprehendable. Okay, yeah, we can't comprehend it. What else? Huh? Perfect love. Perfect love. Come on, give me some more. What? I can hear you. Complete. Complete in every way. Yeah, you start piling on the descriptions. It is infinite love. Holy love, blameless love, intimate love, passionate love, determined love toward one another. There was no sin to throw up obstacles in that relationship. There was no sin to create misunderstandings or fights. It was pure, infinite, boundless, passionate, intimate love with no constraints of humanity upon it. Divine love. Alright, now, this is what happens when God saves you. He takes you and brings you into the very heart of that communion of love. So that God the Father now loves you to the same degree that He loves Jesus. God the Father loves you on the same level as He loves His only begotten Son. That's what adoption does for us. We are now joint heirs with Christ. When it comes to God's love, it's not like He loves Jesus up here and us somewhere down here. It's Jesus here and us here. Can you begin to get your brain around that reality? God would love me like He loves Jesus and has loved Him for all eternity? Yes. A third picture of His love. Zephaniah 3.17. Somebody read it. The Lord your God. In stereo. We all knew that was going to happen. Go ahead and do it. The Lord your God is in your midst, a, vic a victorious warrior. He will exalt over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. All right, this passage, many of you know this passage well, but I want you to think about it. Our typical picture of God is of this stoic, right? Yes, or two days, miser. Holds his gifts tightly, right? And therefore, and also holds his emotions tightly, right? So he's like this, his mean grandfather in heaven, always has a furrowed brow as he looks on us, just waiting for us to mess up so he can punish. This says that picture of God is a lie. It blows it up. And says, God in his love for you, if you're in Christ, is one in which he exults over you. He sings with joy because of you. You may look at your life and say, nobody exults over me. Nobody rejoices over me. Certainly nobody sings over me, except for maybe my mother. God does. He sings. He dances because of you. There's a phrase there. He will be quiet in his love. It's a little bit difficult to interpret. But it likely means this. Quietness in love is love deeply felt. A quiet inner contemplating, reflecting of his love for us. It'd be like if I'm out of town, right, for a month at RYM or whatever. I'm out of town and I come back home and my children are sleeping. This was especially true when they were young. I would walk in to their bedroom 
and I'd sit down on their bedside. I'd just watch them sleep. Do you know your parents do this? It's spooky, but they do it. <laughs> just watch you sleep. Oh. And while I'm watching them sleep, I'm thinking about how much I love them. How deep my love is for them. How fierce it is. And I'm brought to tears over its depth. That's what God does with you. He contemplates His love for you. He deeply feels His love for you. You say, there's no way. That is too good to be true. Gang, it is so good. And it is so true. My daddy is almost 80 years old. He lives in Memphis. And I've noticed this about my dad. The older he gets, when I go visit him and I'm getting ready to leave and come home, he's always done this. He's always given me a hug. He's always told me he loves me. He's kind of a reserved guy. But he's always done that. The older he gets, this is what I've noticed. When I'm getting ready to leave, he holds me just a little bit longer and a little bit tighter than he used to. Through that long, tight embrace, he's expressing his joy over me, his love for me. Gang, I am 48 years old, and it's still the most secure feeling in this world. That's what we have with God. We have His divine embrace. And even though everything in your life may be screaming, God is not loving. God is saying, You have my embrace. I'm holding you. I know this hurts. I know your pain. I felt it myself at the cross. But I'm here and I've still got you in the warmth of my embrace. It's not just I'm never going to let you go. It's I'm never going to let you go. Will you allow yourself in the midst of your hurt to actually believe that and lean hard into the breast of your father? Let me close with this story. Let me close with two stories. There was a fellow by the name of Dwight L. Moody who was an old evangelist back in the day. Pastor. And a man who was really struggling with the assurance of his salvation came to Dr. Moody for help. Came into his office one day, said, Mr. Moody, I'm just really struggling with doubts in regard to my salvation. Can you help me? And Moody very kindly asked the man to sit down and said, Certainly, tell me about it. He said, Well, sometimes I'm convinced that I'm a Christian, but then there's just other times when I'm just not sure I am and it's killing me. And so Moody had him turn in his Bible to John 5.24. And he asked the man to read it, and he did. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. And Moody asked the man, well, do you believe that? Well, yes, sir, I believe it. Do you accept it? Yes, sir, I do. Well, then, are you a Christian? And the man said, well, sometimes I think I am, but other times I'm just not sure. And Moody very kindly asked the man to read it again. And he did. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. And Moody asked him again, do you believe that? Well, yes, sir, I believe it. Do you accept it? Well, yes. Well then, are you a Christian? 
And just when the man began to express his doubts again, Moody turned on him, and his eyes flashed in his direction, and he said, See here, man, just whom are you doubting? And it was then that the man realized for the first time that when he doubted his salvation, he wasn't doubting himself. He was in fact doubting God. Do you see the difference? Gang, in your struggle with doubt, this is what it looks like. It looks like humility. You look at yourself and you go, I can't be a Christian. Not with that in my past. Not with all these besetting sins in my present. I can't be a Christian with all of this going on in my life. It's true for everybody else, but it can't be true for me. And it feels low. It feels humble. But what it really is, is arrogance. Because what we're really saying is, God, I understand the gospel, and it may be true for everybody else out there, other people who have better lives, who haven't done what I've done, but it's not true for me. What you did isn't big enough for my sins. You're a liar. That's what we're really doing. Now I'd ask you, how many of you would honestly say you believe in your heart God is a liar? I would venture to say no one in this room would have the inner audacity to verbalize that to the heavens in God's face. Why? Just because you're afraid a bolt of lightning is going to come down? No. Because deep down, you know it's not true. When we doubt our salvation, we're not doubting ourselves. We're doubting the promises of God. But what do we really believe about His promises? Deep down in your heart, you know they're true. You know they're true. Does that make sense? Alright, let me close with this one. There was this elderly man who was an art collector. And he had a son, and as that son grew up, he taught him the art of art collecting. And the son was growing in his appreciation and knowledge. The father would take him on worldwide trips where they would go and view various works of art and buy them. I mean expensive pieces. Van Gogh, Monet, so forth. These are artists. So they're buying these, they're buying these works of art and, and the family estate is just decked out in all of these works of art. Priceless treasures father was so proud of his son. War engulfed the nation and the son went off to serve and fight for his country. A month later the father received a telegram letting him know that his son was missing in action. Two weeks after that his worst fears were confirmed. His son had been killed in action while trying to rescue a wounded soldier. The father was absolutely distraught. The son of his love was dead. He faced the upcoming Christmas holidays just with this sense of loneliness. His son was never going to come home. He went into an utter depression. Christmas Day came. And the father was awakened by a knock at the door. He crawled out of bed in his depression walked by all of these paintings on the wall toward the front door. The paintings again just reminded him his son wasn't coming home. And he opened the door and there stood a soldier. And the soldier had a large package in his hand. And he said, Sir, I was a friend of your son's. I was the one he rescued when he died. Do you mind if I come in 
I have something I'd like to give you. The father welcomed him in, into the house. They went into the living room, sat down on the couch in front of the fireplace. And that soldier said, Your son told me about your love and his love for art. And I wanted to give you this. I'm an artist myself. No expert, but I love to paint. And so the father took that gift and he tore away the brown paper and it gave way to a portrait of his son. It was clearly the work of an amateur, but the soldier had captured the likeness of the son's face with vivid detail. The father was just overwhelmed with gratitude. They spent the rest of the day just sharing stories about his son. And the soldier left. The father took down the most prized painting he had in the entire house, put it down, and replaced it with the picture of his son. Spent the rest of the evening sitting on the couch, gazing at it. Springtime came, and the father became ill and died. But he left instructions in his will that all of the paintings in his family estate were to be sold at an auction, at an auction on the coming, the next Christmas day, the day he had received this portrait of his son. Museum directors, art collectors from all over the world converged to this family estate for this auction. They were all in anticipation. Some of them would go home with priceless works of art. The auctioneer entered the room and he laid the gavel down and he said, let the auction begin. And out came the first painting. But it was a painting that wasn't on anyone's list. It was the painting of the man's son. Who will start the bidding? One hundred dollars. Will anyone start with one hundred dollars? Silence. Anyone, please, bid on the painting. Who will bid? Where do I hear fifty dollars for this painting? Silence. Finally, somebody spoke up in the back and said, We didn't come here to bid on that clear piece of junk. It's clearly the work of an amateur. We came for all of these other paintings. Let's get on with it. The auctioneer said, No, this one must go first. Finally, an old man, white beard, dressed in overalls, stood up and he said, Sir, I'll give you $10 for it. It's all I've got. I knew the boy, and I'd like to have it. Ten dollars. Going once. Going twice. <coughs> so, applause erupts in the room. Finally, we can get on with this auction. Finally, we can get on with these priceless works of art. And then the auctioneer laid down his gavel again, and he said, The auction is now over. What? What do you mean it's over? We demand an explanation. And the auctioneer said, It's simple. According to the will of the Father, whoever takes the Son gets it all. Gang, when you get Jesus, you get it all. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place, including the assurance, the confidence that you are in Christ. I hope these things give you freedom from the paralysis of doubt. Y'all go to your second class.